Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Greg Carinha, editor of Label Narrow Web Magazine, and you've logged on to our webinar, Decision-Making Insights for Narrow Web Label Converters, Thinking About That First UV LED Purchase. This webinar is being sponsored by GEW and produced by Label Narrow Web. Much like digital printing, LED curing is one of the fast growing trends in the label and package printing industry. From the people that I talk to on the show floor at Label Expo Americas, that trend is not expected to slow down anytime soon either. Whether we're talking about energy savings, sustainable endeavors, or just quality of curing, LED hits the mark in numerous areas. In fact, one converter l &W has talked to has experienced 90% energy savings by outfitting their facility and presses with LED curing and lighting. But how do you make the change? There are a number of questions you might be asking, especially as they pertain to the unique setup in your facility. GEW is perfectly suited to answer these questions as a supplier of both UV arc and UV LED technologies. Here, they will discuss everything from system configuration considerations to the ROI process. GEW's UV systems are available for all new machinery, and they can be retrofitted to any active presses, allowing printers to breathe new life into older printing equipment. To help us learn more about this vital topic, which grows in importance by the day, we have two experts joining us from GEW, Jennifer Heathcote and Amir Deckel. Jennifer Heathcote is the VP of Business Development at GEW. An authority on conventional and UV LED technology, Jennifer has been in the industry since 1998 and has served in a wide variety of roles. She can often be seen presenting on this topic at many of the industry's leading events. Meanwhile, Amir Deckel is GEW's VP of Sales. He recently joined GEW as part of the company's emphasis on restructuring its North American operations. Amir boasts international sales, marketing, and management experience alongside expertise in global business development and technology solution sales across various print technologies. Much like Jennifer, Amir is a popular keynote speaker at industry forums. But before I pass it over to our speakers, I have a few housekeeping announcements I'd like to go over. For those of our listeners who are interested in the information that you hear today, this webinar will be archived on the Label and Narrow Web website. That's www.labelandnarrowweb.com. And it will also be available on demand via the link you clicked on to access the webinar today. We will be accepting questions throughout the presentation. You can type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will then collect all the questions and hold them until the end of the presentation. But please go ahead and type in the questions as you think of them. If we don't get to answer all the questions during the session, they will be forwarded to our speakers who will then get back to you directly after the webinar. Finally, if you're having any technical difficulties, like you can't hear the audio, please type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will address it immediately. With that said, we'd like to welcome in our experts who can explain how LED curing can help label narrow web printers from a performance and efficiency standpoint. Jennifer and Amir. Thank you, Greg, and good morning to all of you. We're very excited to have you with us here today. Um, Amir and I are going to go through about 20 slides. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna tackle the first 10, and then Amir is gonna tackle the second 10. We're gonna try to keep our slides to about 15 to 20 minutes each so that we can save plenty of room for questions um, following, following the slide. So please make a note of your questions and we'll address those um, at the end of the presentation. So narrow web label has been a big focus of GEW uh, since the company was started over 30 years ago. Uh, many of you have our equipment on your presses already. Um, many of you are in discussions with us about upgrading that technology and even looking at LED. And so while many of the presentations um, that you see in the industry are all about why to switch to LED or you know, maybe their testimonials and interviews with people who've already gone through that process. We thought we would take a step back and just give you some basic information if you're just starting on that journey and wanna know what to consider um, for that first purchase. And just to give you some things to think about um, and some, some additional information so you know what questions to ask and, and what information to gather. So GEW is a UK-based company. We have regional offices in Ohio and Germany. Amir and I support uh, North America. Uh, Amir is specifically focused on narrow web label. I support him from an applications and process and business development perspective, but then I also sell into and support other markets outside of, of narrow web label. So what is it that GEW has allowed GEW to have the brand recognition and growth in the narrow web label market? Well, a lot of it has to do with our, with our business model. 
you know, we, we try to be a volume supplier. So we make a well-engineered, robust product that's designed specifically for the narrow web label presses. We may sell that technology in other markets, but it was first and foremost designed specifically for narrow web label. We use common architecture across our arc lamps as well as our LED lamps. That means that the components are often interchangeable and can be expanded and scaled as needed. This allows us to achieve economies of scale in manufacturing, and it allows us to bring new products to the market relatively quickly and expand on those as the market needs evolve. We sell everything as a complete system. In other words, we don't sell components. If you called Amir and, and wanted to purchase a lamp head or just the power supply, you know that's not the business that we're in. We take a look at your needs, um, whether you're an OEM or an end user, and we configure a system that specifically matches and is customized to what you are printing and what your end goals are. And we do this in high volume, which allows us to be very competitive in pricing. And then we back that up with our engineering, our application knowledge, and our integration experience. So I thought it would be a good time to just do an overview of UV LED technology and UV LED curing. Um, because it's, unless you have the context of, of what brought us here, it's, it's easy to think that this technology is, is brand new. And it's actually been evolving for quite some time. Believe it or not, RCA tried to develop an LED television in 1972. And they, they knew how to do it. They just didn't have the material science and manufacturing capabilities in order to make that happen. They knew how to produce a red LED and they knew how to produce um, a green LED, but they couldn't make that, that evasive blue LED work. And they could, they could do it in a lab, but it just it wasn't very stable and it wasn't very cost effective. So RCA tabled the development and, and basically went a different direction and, and that technology sat um, pretty much idle for a couple decades until three professors in Japan kind of resurrected it and figured out a method to make blue LEDs um, stable and, and scalable in a manufacturing environment. The blue LED sits right on the edge of the UV spectrum. So as those blue LEDs went into manufacturing and then they were coated with phosphorus to make the, the white LEDs that we see in general lighting and the backlighting and all of our electronic devices, as they were making those blue LEDs and, and white LEDs, anything that was spilling over to the UV spectrum was just given to the sales team and said, see if you can find a home for this technology because we don't have a use for it and it's just going to be scrapped. So those diodes around 2004 started to make their way into the market. And that's when we started you know, developing LED lamp technology. It wasn't very powerful. It was still quite expensive. It didn't last very long. But 2004 is really the beginnings of UV LED lamp technology and UV LED curing. In 2008, RMGT launched the first UV LED press for sheet fed offset in Drupa. In 2009, Gala showcased the first UV LED on a, a narrow web flexo press at Europe. It wasn't a commercially saleable technology, but they did show the market what was possible. And then in 2012, Mark Andy came out with the first commercially available UV LED narrow web flexo press at Label Expo Americas. Um, in 2014, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded to those three professors in Japan for basically three decades of innovation with blue LED uh, technology. And, and we owe them our, their, you know, our credit to them because without their work, you know, we would not be having this webinar and we would not be using LED technology on any of our presses. Uh, GEW wasn't a pioneer in LED. Um, while we've been doing UV arc lamps for 30 years, we did not get into LED technology until 2015. But what we had at the time was a strong business model and a, a superior manufacturing process and engineering team and knowledge of the narrow web label market that allowed us to make a product specifically for this market. And so we caught up very, very quickly, which is why you see our technology on many of the presses in the field today. And so that brings us to 2022. And what's different about 2022 is I, as I do believe that LED for narrow web label is really at the tipping point. And what's driving that is one, the global energy crisis. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Market consolidation, and then the net zero pledges. This has really brought us to the tipping point with LED. And I think the next you know, five years are gonna see 
significant growth. Um, if you don't have LED in your, your plant today, you probably will have it over the next five years. So just to give you an idea of how Amir and I overlap this, this timeline, uh, just so that you can understand that we, we, we do have some background to what we're gonna be saying today. I started in UV curing in 1998 and LED technology in 2007. So I've had a front, you know, front row seat to participate in the evolution of this technology. Amir has been in their web label since 2000. Um, he and I are past, unfortunately, never crossed until this year, um, but he brings all his vast knowledge of narrow web label and it kind of couples with my background in UV technology. So I joined GW in 2020 and, and Amir joined um, earlier this year. So how do we quantify value of, of new technology, new innovation? Well, I, I love this chart. I didn't, I didn't invent it. I kind of borrowed it, redrew it, and, and applied it to LED technology. And, and you can overlap this timeline in different market segments. So if we just think about this with respect to their web label, the y-axis represents pace and value of innovation, whereas the x-axis is time and years. And if you look at the left half of the chart, um, the purple line is linear growth. That's established technology. So that's going to be your conventional arc lamps. Conventional electrode arc lamps were pioneered. Uh, the first prototypes were in the 1890s. So we've got 130 years of arc lamp evolution. So every year they only get a little bit better. Uh, we can incorporate new technology, new electronics into the system. But when you vaporize mercury in a quartz tube, you're really limited to the physics of, of vaporized mercury. So the purple line, that straight line, really shows you the incremental growth of mature established technology like a conventional arc lamp. Whereas the green curve represents new technology, in this case, an LED system. So to the left of that vertical dashed line, um, where the green curve is below the purple line, that is where new technology sits for a long time, right? Because nobody has proper context or proper reference. What they know is what they've been using for decades. So when we compare the green line to the purple line in the early days, arc lamps always outperform an LED system because nobody really knows how to use them. You've got an existing system that seems to work. Why would you switch? So there's always a period of time, it could be five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, where the market likes to stick with the existing technology. And eventually you get to the point where people start to get it. The industry starts to get it, the suppliers come together, and the new technology all of a sudden starts to solve problems that the old technology can't. And once you cross that line, you enter this period of exponential growth there's disruptive stress and opportunity, and people start to realize that the new technology can do things the old technology could never do. And a good example of that is you can think about the iPhone. When the iPhone first came out in 2007, it had a retail price of $500. And most people who had a cell phone at that time could not even think of spending $500 for a new cell phone, even if it had these strange things called app that nobody ever really knew what they were at the time. You just couldn't you know, bear to bring yourself to spend $500 on a phone, and you didn't understand the value of all those additional features that it offered. Fast forward 15 years, now people spend well over $1,000 every year just to have the latest and greatest phone, and you really understand the value of, of reading email on the go and sending text messages and being able to surf the internet and access all the apps and the technology. Many of us are lost without our phones. And so that's just a good example of showing how new technology, it's very difficult to quantify the value because you don't have proper context and you don't really know what problems it's gonna solve because you didn't even know those problems existed. So another way we can look at quantifying the value of new innovation is that when suppliers speak with you about the product that they're selling, they'll give you a laundry list of features and benefits. They'll tell you why it's so great, why you should buy it. But the problem is, is that if features and benefits don't solve a problem, they really don't have value. They may be nice to have, they may be interesting, but if they're not going to make you better off or put you in a better situation, it's very difficult to justify that purchase. And so this is another, you know, illustration of where LED technology was in its early days. If you don't have a reference point, you don't know how to gauge that value. When you're doing your ROI, the input variables are a bit subjective. 
they're based on real and perceived value of both you as a user as well as the seller. And so until we can actually help you quantify that value, it's very difficult to justify moving forward. So fast forward to 2022 today, and one of the main problems that LED technology is solving, it's a key answer to the energy crisis. And it's helping customers reach net zero targets, and it's helping customers offset increasing energy costs and make them more competitive. So we don't have time to get into the energy story in detail, but there is a previous webinar we did on our website. Um, so please go to our website. And you, if you don't have an understanding of how the electrical grid works, I encourage you to watch that webinar. If you can't find the link on our website, please send Amir or me an email, and we will send you the link. Um, the electrical grid for decades, when electricity has been very reliable. So when electricity is reliable, plentiful and affordable, nobody thinks about it, right? It's just something that happens. What most people don't really realize is that electricity is made on demand. When you turn on the light, when you plug anything into an outlet and you power it on, when you turn your press on, the closest utility or power plant has to deliver that power to you. They have to generate it, transmit it, deliver it, and you consume it in real time. There's no other product that's consumed that way. And so what, by switching from a conventional arc lamp or even a solvent or thermal dryer to LED technology, what you're doing is you're reducing the installed system power in your plant. So the transformer that's bringing power into your plant, you're now pulling less power off of it, which frees up more capacity for other manufacturing processes, or it just reduces the total power that your facility is using. The second item there, UV LED reduces peak demand at startup. This is so critical. This is why electricity companies, power plants, um, will give you a rebate for going with LED. Peak demand is the number one indicator that drives utilities to make the decision that they have to add additional generating capacity. And so by lowering peak demand, they keep the system more intact and don't have to make those hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in a new, um, new uh, power generating facility. So lowering peak demand is what LED does, and that's incredibly important to not only the utility, but also your utility bill. 40% of your electricity bill is often because of your, a high peak demand. So lowering that lowers your electricity bills. LED reduces electricity use during uh, consumption, and it also lowers your carbon footprint, including companies that are already net zero. So within the, the spectrum, uh, UV spectrum, the reason LED technology is a little bit different than an arc lamp is because of the type of wavelengths that UV LED emits. We can break the UV spectrum down into bands. Those bands span 100 to 450 nanometers. And to give you perspective, the sheet of paper you see on the left of that slide, a sheet of paper is 100,000 nanometers thick. That's four thousandths of an inch, right? So very, very tiny. And we're only talking about 100 to 450 nanometers. It's a billionth of a meter. So, so these, these distances between wavelengths are very, very, very short. But we categorize those into segments. Um, reading left to right, we have vacuum UV, which is absorbed by oxygen, so typically doesn't play a role in curing. UVC is short wavelengths absorbed at the surface. UVB is a bit longer. UVA and UV visible are very long wavelengths that penetrate deep into materials. What that means is the LED, which sits right on that border between UVA and UV, V, because it penetrates through and deep, it's better for curing through films, foils, and laminates, and it's very good at, pen at penetrating and curing heavily pigmented formulations. So what does that mean in a practical sense? Well, where LED is best today, so if you're just looking at LED, where you should absolutely be using LED technology, and, and these are areas where I don't even recommend ARC anymore, where you should be using LED today, either on a new press purchase or on a retrofit, is in curing laminating and cold foil adhesives, casting cure coatings, primers, white inks, because the titanium dioxide absorbs all, which gives white its pigment color, 
absorbs all wavelengths below 380 nanometers. So with LED at 395 nanometers, all of that energy is going into the reaction. It's not being absorbed by the pigment. And the same applies to, to most things. So this is where you should start. This is where LED is always better than an arc lamp. Arc and LED are comparable for, for black and yellow inks. You know, black and yellow are always the problem colors. They're the most challenging colors to cure. But you can do it with both arc and LED. Pressure-sensitive adhesives, the syrup kinds, as well as, as standard overprint varnishes, and low migration formulations. LED gives you better process control. So the second category, you could use either arc or LED. LED definitely works, um, but if you're new, I would start at that, that top um, where LED is, is a better fit. And then finally, we've got the category where ARC is better. You know, it doesn't mean that LED doesn't work for some of these, um, but in many cases, we don't have an LED solution and it, it's better to stick with ARC. And this is where anything that needs very robust mechanical and chemical surface properties, you know, these are the industrial top coats, hard coats, clear coats, there's no commercially available LED silicone release. There's no commercially available LED hot melt adhesive. There are some commercially available uh, formulations that, that adjust coefficient of friction, but the process windows are very narrow, so this is not where you want to start. And effectively, it's all your highly functional chemistry. So for my skiers out there, I thought I'd put a, a little color code on here. So for anyone who's been skiing, you know, they, they mark the hills so that you know what you're getting into. So a green circle always tells you the beginner hills, the bunny hills. These are the hills that if you know how to stand on a pair of skis, you're probably not going to run into a tree. You're probably not going to break your leg or ski off a cliff. So we can kind of correlate this to LED technology. If you're just starting out, start on the green hills. This is going to be an easy path a straightforward path. There's lots of solutions out there. You're, you're very guaranteed uh, for, for high you know, success and an easy transition. The blue squares are going to be our, our intermediate hills. Don't start here. Start with the green circles. Intermediate hills are very doable. They're very possible, but you kind of have to have some background so that you can dial into that process window a little bit better. And then third, we have our double black diamonds. Do not start here if you have no experience in UV and if you have no experience in LED. You are going to ski off a cliff and you're probably going to break your leg. This is not where you should start. It is possible and there's a lot of development work going on here and we are seeing some success, but these are companies that are a bit further down the road that really have the resources to dive into these um, more challenging uh, formulations. And then I, there's one more note on the slide. Dual cure formulations will work with both ARC and LED. Uh, formulators can design specifically for ARC, specifically for LED, or they can formulate them and they increasingly are formulating them to cure for both. So a couple more slides here and I'm gonna transition it to Amir. Um, if you look at a spec sheet for LED technology, there's lots of data on there. You may not really understand what this data means. So if we look at max electrical power, this is the watts per centimeter or watts per inch. This is what's going into the lamp. It tells us nothing about what's coming out, but if you compare LED systems across vendors or even within a single company, it gives you an idea of how much energy is going into that, that lamp head. And LED lamp head consumption is significantly lower um, than, a, than, a, than an arc lamp system. Peak wavelength. 395 nanometer is what most people are using. This is a, gives us photo initiator selection, so the chemists have to match what's coming out of the, the lamp head. Peak irradiance, this is the rate of energy transfer. A watt is a joule per second. So irradiance or intensity is a joule per second per centimeter squared. This is how quickly I'm transferring energy out of my lamp to the surface. It's, it's very tempting to think a bigger number is always better, but once you saturate the chemistry, that additional energy will just convert to thermal energy or heat. So typically within narrow web label, 16 to 25 watts per square centimeter is a good range that we want to operate in. Total dose or energy density at speed, this is what drives your max web speed. And this is the spec that most deviates across LED systems on the field. You may have two, three, four vendors that look like they have the same product, but as you ramp up that web speed to increasingly high speeds, only the companies that emit higher dose are gonna be able to cure successfully at faster web speeds. 
the maximum length of the lamp, we needed to cover the entire width of your web, as well as the cross section. Does it fit the narrow web press that you're trying to integrate to? Or in the case of a new press, the OEM is already going to have this sorted out for you. Cooling, we can cool the LED head with either water or air. Um, LED technology is not 100% efficient, just like any electrical device. We've got about 30 to 40% of the energy is converted to UV light. The rest of it is converted to electrical heat that has to be removed in much the same way your charger or your laptop heats up when you're using it. So we can do both water and air. It really is a personal or plant preference. Your higher powered LED systems are always going to be cooled with water as opposed to air. And then ArcLet compatible. Can the technology swap back and forth between an, um, a Mercury Arc cassette as well as an LED cassette? So these are just some things to think about as you're looking across vendors and looking across GEW's um, portfolio product offering. And then my last slide before I switch it to Mir is just about matching a UV system to the needs of application. Start with your formulator. Find out for the SKUs you're using, are they only Arc? Is there an LED offering? Is there a dual cure offering? What's that minimum irradiance, that rate of energy that I need to react to the chemistry? Once I hit that minimum, anything above it is, is going to work. Energy to react the chemistry. This is my dose at web speed. This is super critical, and this is where most LED systems on the market diverge from each other. How do I keep that, that web cool? Do I use an ch integrated chill plate or chilled roller? And then what about that form factor? Does it fit my press? Does it fit the web path? And does it meet my application needs? And then finally, what are the conditions of your plant? Is there a lot of um, contamination in the air? Is it a clean plant? Is it a clean room? These are things to think about as we help you select whether a water-cooled or air-cooled system is best for you. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Amir. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, always a pleasure listening to you. Um, you know so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is I'm, kind of, I'm going to try and put some practicality uh, into all the terms and and the ideas and the concepts uh, that Jen uh, put uh, put forth in the in the first half of this presentation, and how it is uh, actually applicable to whatever we need to produce uh, on an L web machines. So in general, we 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 kind of subdividing. Uh, the, the LED uh, solution into two distinct uh, groups that are separate by the, uh, uh, the way they, we cool uh, the lamp heads. So um, on the left-hand side, you can see a water-cooled solution. On the right-hand side, an, an air-cooled um, solution. And um, it is really depending on what do you need uh, in your specific application in terms of uh, irradiance and energy that uh, Jen mentioned just a couple minutes ago to decide whether you go with one or the other. The water cooled are usually more powerful than, than the air cooled. They also can cover a wider web um, uh, than, than the air cooled uh, uh, solutions. Within the water cooled, we have two types of solution. One is a cassette type that you see right in the center of, uh, of that slide, and the other one is, uh, is a, a fixed installed. Uh, lamp head, uh, which uh, can be mounted. It requires a lot less a lot less uh, space uh, to be mounted, and can be, can be mounted in a very tight places. Um, the deficiency of that is that you cannot just you know remove it to clean or replace or whatever. Uh, it, it, it takes a little a little bit more effort. Effort on the right hand side, you see our air cooled uh, solution. In terms of names, the air cooled solution we call Aero LED or AeroLED, and uh, the, uh, the water could be called a Leo LED or Leo LED. <clears throat> now, in general, for most practical applications on Aero web, uh, we would use an air-cooled uh, solution. Uh, this is up to 60 centimeters, which is about 20-something uh, inches uh, web width. And as opposed to, uh, I would say, most of our competitors, if not all of them, we use a negative cooling um, architecture. And what I mean by negative cooling is we take air from the press environment, run it through the lamp heads, and then evacuate it either away uh, 
from the press out out to the uh, it could be inside the, the building or outside the building through a, a, a hole in a roof or, or something of that sort. Now the advantage of that is that we do not heat up or we do not add the heat unnecessarily heat into the press environment. And and remember that the lampads are and, and you see a photo in a minute uh, just about body level of of a pressman. And it's not that pleasant to get all that heat, you know, being uh, um, uh, radiated right uh, into you. Um, so this is really a unique uh, example that we have compared to a competitor and, and adds uh, a lot of flexibility to our solutions. The way the, the, the water cool uh, system operates is uh, by uh, uh, using a chiller you see on the left hand side. Uh, photo you can see on the left of the left hand side photo you can see the chiller uh, to the right of it is our uh, power supply or rhino rack where all the power supplies uh, of the lamp heads are residing and on the front of that image you see our uh, leo led uh, lamp heads which is which are cassette type and the the water hoses that that coming through uh, the lamp head in order to bring uh, chilled water and cool uh, uh, the LED down. Uh, on, on the right hand side, from the other hand, you can see our, uh, an example of a Leo LED, a water cooled um, LED curing system that is mounted on a, on a Comco or ProGlide. And the nice thing about that, that this is mounted on a chill roller. And if you remember, Jen mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, we do have to consider how to make sure that the substrate is kept in the controlled temperature. And one of the ways to do it is um, uh, run it uh, uh, over chill roller. Now, I mean, if you look, um, you know, as anecdotal, uh, look at this Comco ProGlide. This is a, a relatively nice, uh, an old machine, and if you put, if you take an old machine and you put a brand new LED system, you el elongated the life of that machine for, you know, a good 10, 12 more years, uh, as opposed to just discarding that machine and buy a new one. So this is another opportunity to make your equipment or your assets last longer. So, um, in terms of uh, power, um, we have uh, some unique uh, uh, feature compared to uh, other supplier of UV uh, solutions that we are able to utilize both uh, technologies, conventional UV and LED-based uh, UV, uh, in the same system and in the same lamp head. And all you need to do in order to uh, convert a specific color station from conventional to uh, LED is to just change the cassette. You just slide the cassette of the conventional and put the LED or vice versa. And when you do that, you immediately, um, the system immediately identi identify what kind of cassette is in and uh, setting up the power the way it should be in order to power properly the LED on its optimal operating, uh, operating point. Uh, we call that technology ARC LED or hybrid, arc LED, a hybrid technology, and we pair them by power, meaning for a lower power application, uh, applications, uh, we're using the, uh, the air-cooled solutions, and the conventional would be our E2C uh, cassettes or lamp heads, and our LED would be the AeroLED. And for a higher power applications, um, which you can see on the right-hand side of that slide, we use uh, the Leo LED as our LED solution and the E4C as our conventional solution. Now, again, let me, I, I cannot overemphasize that point. You can freely change between the two uh, cassettes of the same uh, uh, cooling family um, as your application calls. So you can replace the E2C with the Aero LED as many times as you need, you know, to spec your application, and same applies to the E4C and the and the Leo LED or Leo LED. Here you can see a couple examples. 
Um, and if you remember again, Jen mentioned the importance of uh, chilling the substrate. Uh, you know, chilled uh, substrate um, guarantees a, a, a well-controlled process, and we can do it in two or, or more ways. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see an, a, a, a chilled a plate, or what we call a chilled heat sink also, that is uh, right um, uh, uh, underneath the, the substrate. On the right-hand side, uh, you can see a LEOLED uh, system that um, is actually mounted on a chill roller uh, that makes sure that the uh, substrate is uh, kept at the, at the optimal temperature. Next, and in order to make it really practical, to make this presentation really practical, um, we're going to go through you as an Aero web printer. What do you need to check or what do you need to consider when you're moving from conventional uh, to, to an LED? And this is kind of a laundry list that is divided into five uh, different areas um, where each area will help you narrow down to what exactly the solution that you need in order to uh, convert your machine and your plant to an LED and get all the benefits that uh, Jen, Jennifer uh, mentioned a few minutes ago. So the first one is we need to evaluate the press, the application, and the plant. Um, you know, as an example, what's the web width? Um, what's the speed that, that you're running? What's the planning, plans, uh, plant's environment? Is it hot? Is it cold? What kind of jobs do you want to run? On that, is it a new job, a new press, or an old press? All that need to be considered. The next uh, category is: Do you need flexibility? Do you have some old jobs that will only run on on arc or conventional UV, uh, or or you can convert everything to LED? Um, do you have a mix, and what kind of mix you have? So all that can be. Uh, tied up into an arc LED solution and to ensure that you have all the flexibility you need in order to uh, run the job that, that you need. What kind of cooling uh, would you need? That ties up with power, obviously. Do you need high power? Then it's definitely uh, water. Or if you need lower power, it would most likely be air. Um, but uh, if, if you consider cooling, maybe you can consider if you have a, a central a chill roller at your plant, then it's a, it's a little easier and cheaper to do a water uh, water to water heat exchanger instead of uh, of a chiller for the uh, specific system. So that need to be considered as well. As I mentioned uh, earlier, do you need or want to um, keep keep the uh, your substrate temperature low? Then you definitely need to consider chill plate or or chill he uh, heat sink or chill rollers. And the last category is specifically to that uh, ink that you're going to cure. What is the irradiance? What is the wavelength that is needed? What is the optimal irradiance that uh, is needed? And I think by far the most important parameter is what is the energy dose or the energy density that needed to be applied for, uh, to the ink in order to cure it at your run speed. So this is kind of a laundry list that you can go through when you when you hesitate uh, over um, moving to LED or not. And, and we are standing by to help you with all of these items as we have a lot of experience gained already in, in, this, um, in this field. In terms of, uh, of integration, um, if you buy a new press from, uh, from a press uh, vendor, that, that integration uh, will be uh, already done. But if you need to do a retrofit, and we do a, a lot of retrofits uh, to LED uh, in the field or to an arc LED systems, um, then uh, you should talk to us or to any other UV vendor and uh, to completely understand um, what your press needs. Um, the company can design and do all the necessary um, uh, parts and components that are needed in order to retrofit your machine to uh, uh, get a, an LED solution. And almost finally, um, I'd like to refer to the power aspect that uh, Jennifer alluded to that a few, a few slides ago, um, and the importance of that, uh, of being uh, a net zero in terms of carbon footprint or just 
um, power consumption reduction or significant power consumption uh, reductions. And what we did here on that slide, we compared three uh, systems. One is the conventional one, or based on our E2C, that runs on a on a 45 centimeters, about, about 17 inch uh, eight uh, station press, to a Leo LED, which is again a water cooled uh, LED system, and yet to the Aero LED, which is the air cooled system. And what you can see that in terms of power. There is a significant power reduction between a conventional to an air cooled. There, there is a power reduction to the water cooled, but not as significant as it is to the air. Um, it is uh, uh, almost almost the 70 percent is 66 percent less power uh, uh, consumption, and in turn, your energy consumption is being reduced dramatically from about uh, 200,000 kilowatt hour on a year, on a typical year, to only 83,000 kilowatt hour. Just imagine what that does to uh, your uh, energy bill. Now, what you may want to do is go to a website where we have um, uh, a, a page where you can plug in your uh, information in terms of your press uh, how many color stations, what's the web width, um, what's your shift pattern, uh, and um, and what's your uh, kilowatt hour charge, and then we can tell you how much energy you would save a year, as well as uh, what the carbon footprint is going to look like. So that just about concluding that, and uh, I believe we are open. We will open uh, to the uh, questions section at that point. Yeah, thank that's you very much for way. listening to us. Yep. Th thank you. Thank you both. Uh, that was great information and very informative. Uh, and we have had some questions coming in. So now I'd like to take the opportunity to go through some of these questions uh, that our viewers have had. The so one that just came in uh, a few minutes ago, uh, do you test current ink suppliers and do you have an inks evaluation report for shrink sleeves? So so we don't we don't have a formal program where we're, we're testing all the inks that are available in the market. We do have an applications lab at our UK office, and we do work with the ink vendors and the formulation vendors to to test with our with our products. But at the end of the day, um, UV curing is a process, right? So just because I can react the ink doesn't necessarily directly translate to the press, right? You have to have all the other variables in place. So what I do in my lab is just to make sure that we can react it. But what you have to do on the press is understand your operating window and, and we can work with you on that. All of the ink developers, all the formulation developers have LED systems in their labs and they are doing all of those tests themselves as part of the development process. So um, unfortunately we don't have like a report that we do for each SKU of ink available. But we can give you, based on that slide I showed you where I kind of compared it to the, the downhill skiing um, warnings for the, the, the grade of the hill, we can give you an indication of what should be working and, and, and maybe the areas to stay, stay away from. So I know that doesn't directly give you the answer you were looking for, but hopefully it gives you a little more insight. That's definitely helpful. And uh, I have two questions here that I'm sort of going to combine into one uh, sort of directly and, and a little broader. Do you have a dealer in Brazil and uh, do you have local representation there? And then maybe uh, if you could touch on um, the representation you have globally and how, how you're in position to support uh, your customers. Um, maybe I'll take that, Jen. Yep, go ahead. Uh, all right. So um, first of all, we do have a dealer in Brazil um, as we have dealers in uh, uh, most of the countries uh, of the world. And um, some, uh, a big portion of, of the world we support direct. Um, for example, uh, all of North, uh, North America and Europe, uh, Europe including the UK, now the UK is not part of Europe, so we have to distinguish that. Um, and uh, we, we support direct and all the other places we support through uh, agents and dealers. Some of our agents uh, or distributors um, will also um, do the, the technical support that is required and some of them we will 
uh, support through our uh, engineers. They may be flown in or, or drove, drive in to wherever they need to do the service. We also have a global supply of um, uh, spare parts and consumables that, that we ship worldwide. And uh, some of them are, are local to the countries. If you mention Brazil, uh, we do have an agent in Brazil that has local uh, spare parts and consumable components to support our conventional uh, system. And a couple of things I will add to that. Um, if you are a formulator, I think um, if you're a formulator in Brazil, then then please contact us as directly. We can give you kind of that um, co-supplier support. Um, if you are an end user in, in Brazil, then certainly um, speak with your, your narrow web OEM press supplier. Um, we recently promoted Vinnie Munzberg. Um, many of you may know her. She was a customer support person within GEW for the last six years and had been focused on Latin America. Um, so as of November 1st, we have promoted her to a sales position. Um, she's going to be focusing on um, Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil specifically, um, but certainly will be responsible for, for all of Latin America where it comes to, to narrow web label. So congratulations to Vinny. That's great. Thank you for that. It. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure we did. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, another question that came in here from one of our attendees, is there any example uh, of using LED lamps for water-based UV LED inks that you can give us? So water-based UV, water-based LED, it is still a relatively new concept, but believe it or not, we do have active projects. Um, I can't think of a specific example that's, that's commercialized today. That doesn't mean that there isn't one um, but I can tell you I've got about three that I'm working on at the moment. And, and for those of you who, who've never heard of water-based UV, effectively what it is, is the monomer is a portion of the, um, the ink or the coating that controls viscosity. And it's a very specific chemical component. Water-based UV, water-based LED, removes all or part of that monomer and replaces it with water. Um, it might be necessary for maybe a food packaging application or to get around an OSHA requirement or an emissions requirement for something else that may have been in a, a water-based or solvent-based formulation. So what happens is we pull out some of the chemistry that's 100% solids, replace it with water, which means I have to flash off that water before I cure it with either a conventional UV or an LED system. So it adds an extra step of a thermal heater to flash off the water, but it reduces the chemical content before, before curing. So there are some really interesting reasons why there are people that are starting to look at it. Um, completely possible. And like I said, we've got three active projects that we're, we're talking to people right now. So maybe in a year's time, I can probably give more specific concrete examples. But at the moment, I would just say that uh, to say stay tuned. And if you have a project that you want to do water-based UV, by all means, reach out to us. Terrific. Thank you. And a little bit more of a general question here. How do you view LED market growth in the narrow web market? Amir, I'll let you do that so, one. Yeah, I'll take that one. Thanks. Um, so um, I, I must admit, you know, I joined LED, uh, GW only earlier this year. And um, and I was a little, you know, being in the, in the narrow web market for, for a long time, I was a little bit oblivious to what happened to LED, um, you know, in, in recent years. And, and the, Jennifer mentioned in the beginning of uh, when, when she showed that chart, um, it, it seems like every place I go today, and I'm not even skipping one, every place I see interest in, in LEDs. Even people that are approaching us initially to, um, to, uh, uh, on, on a conventional system, when you when you start uh, discussing the the advantages uh, of LED, they immediately are going uh, you know towards that direction. And we we today submit, um, I would say, right around 60 70 percent of our quotes would be uh, with LED involved, where where as only 
a year or two years ago, it was the other way around. It was um, most of the quotes were um, conventional only. So uh, the market is in a tipping point. It does go very quickly towards LED now. And uh, we see it on, on, on our daily endeavors. And we see it only in, on the global uh, market, um, you know, where we talk with our OEM partners and, and everybody else. It's all going into LED. Absolutely. And what what I will add is that, you know, there are companies out there, there are printers out there who've been running LED for 10 years, absolutely been running them for 10 years. The reason we're at the tipping point is twofold. One, um, the the energy crisis has, has positioned LED to solve a very real problem that's only getting increasingly worse over the next decades. I read this, it's definitely over this next decade and potentially beyond. Right. If we're not investing in the electrical grid in the way we have done in the past and we're, we're asking the grid to be replaced with solar and wind, which are going to struggle to power manufacturing plants, we have to find a way to reduce not only the, the demand and the consumption, but a way to offset those those rising electricity costs. That is where LED is becoming the go to solution for printers. The other thing that's happened, um, and, and, and we're all aware of this, there's a lot of consolidation in their web label that's happening right now. Um, individuals who've built businesses for decades are retiring, you know, they're selling to the multinationals. So the decision making is moving from, you know, the, the press floor to the C-suite, right? And if you talk, if you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a, with a press operator, a, a plan engineer, a quality manager, they're very intimately involved with the process. They've got a solution in place that works. So they see nothing but risk in switching, right? Because they have a solution that works and any change, whether it's a good or a negative, positive or negative change is a change, right? So over the last 10 years, the reluctance was always at the plant level because they have to get, they're responsible for getting product out the door. They're responsible for making quality product. They're the ones that at the end of the day have to answer for why the change was made. Because of the consolidation, that decision making is rising to a higher level by people that are a little bit more re removed from maybe, you know, everything that's involved, but they see the bigger picture. They see the fact that all the innovation is happening in LED. They see the fact that, that LED is going to allow them to move closer and closer to net zero. They see the fact that they just invested in this acquisition and they want to make investments in technology and LED is standing out as the go to choice for a lot of that consolidation. If you did not invest in LED over the last 10 years, you get a pass. I really don't think you've missed too much. You're maybe a little bit behind, but you didn't miss out. If you don't invest in LED in the next five years, you are gonna find yourself behind your, your competitors and it's gonna be increasingly more difficult to catch up. We are at the tipping point for the reasons I mentioned. You cannot afford to not at least consider this technology going forward. Would you agree, Amir? I agree 100%, and and this is what I see. I see. I, I feel some urgency coming from our customers. Yeah, I, I I want it. I want it now. I need it now, uh, especially on places where energy costs are increasing, or there's a pressure. There's sometimes uh, you know governmental bodies pressure to reduce the carbon footprint, or customer pressure to reduce uh, uh, footprint. For example, Walmart now uh, grading the the vendors according to the carbon footprint as well. So uh, all that, you know, lends itself into a, a high efficiency, low energy product. That's great. And you actually uh, covered a couple of the other questions that I had here, so that's fantastic. Uh, and in your experience, um, how do press operators, how do converters typically embrace the change to new technology? I mean, we always talk about you know, not getting stuck doing things the same way as you always have. How do you feel like that uh, initial changes and how receptive uh, the converters are to making that switch? So um, it, it's a funny, funny that you asked that. Uh, whoever asked this question, it's funny because um, m many times the you know when when people starting to talk about LEDs, they're still in, on the denial. Stage. Just say, you know, why me? I mean, why do I need to do that? And um, and uh, when, but but then, what we do normally is 
um, you know, some of the concerns that people have um, would be on the inks. Uh, now we have to change inks and what we need to do with all that. So what we many, many times doing, we do a triangle meeting. We come, we, we, we bring the ink supply of that specific print house and the printing, the, the printers themselves. And we sit down in a triangle and believe it or not, sometimes in, in half an hour to 45 minutes, all the concerns and all the, uh, the uh, hesitations are gone. Um, because again, as Jennifer mentioned earlier today, this technology is mature. It's not something that started yesterday. It does take off now because of various reasons, but in terms of technology itself, it, it is mature. So um, once we do this triangle meeting, almost all the hesitations go away and now it's become a practicality, you know, when, where, how, and so on. It, 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 it's, it's interesting too. I mean, I we've got enough experience now where we can sit down after the meeting that Amir just mentioned and give very good guidance to printers as to which stations they should run LED and, they, and which stations they should run ARC. But as any technology transitions, you can look at, at hybrid uh, automobiles. Um, you can even go back to when electricity was first being uh, expanded in the cities. A lot of your lights, you know, back in the you know early 1900s were gas. It was gas-powered lamps. And when electricity was first wired into a lot of the mansions, particularly in Chicago those lamps inside those houses were hybrid and the fact that they were powered by both gas and electric, which seems crazy to me at the moment, but they were afraid that the electricity would be unreliable and they wanted to have that backup of gas in the evening when, when, when things were dark. So the, the hybrid solution that GEW brings to the table, you know, allows you to transition to LED at a pace that you are comfortable with. We can tell you which stations to put LED, dedicated LED, and which stations to put a dedicated arc or maybe a few hybrid stations. But if you want that flexibility, you can put arc led at every station, and that helps appease maybe some of that that nervous that nervousness about making a transition for the first time. But I, I foresee as as you go to that second and, and third press you're going to be running LED at, at almost all stations and we'll have no need for an arc lamp, um, you know, pretty much going forward. That's fantastic. And uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I know that uh, Jennifer and Amir are both, uh, their knowledge and services are required elsewhere. So I don't want to keep them too much longer. Obviously, I feel like we could probably spend another hour going through questions. Uh, this is such a fascinating topic. Um, but this has all been great information. I'd like to thank you for your insight here. I know I really learned a lot. Um, and uh, if uh, there's anything that uh, you think of uh, later on, this is for our attendees, uh, feel free to email us. We'll get the questions over to our speakers. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank uh, Jennifer and Amir for providing us with this valuable information, especially as more companies are looking to cut energy costs and reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, and I'd like to thank our attendees for, uh, for participating in our Q&A se session and following along. And uh, we thank you for joining us for this valuable webinar. For those interested in reviewing the information that you heard here today, this session will be archived on the Label and Narrow Web website. Uh, and again, that's www.labelandnarrowweb.com. And it will be available using the same link that you clicked on to access the webinar today. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.